Huh. You good? Okay. <clears throat> All right, my friends. It's a pleasant sight to see you. It really is. And um, we're going to continue our study of Acts. James is out of town, so I'm filling in for him tonight, and then he'll pick up, Lord willing, on Sunday. And we're going to go through the first part of Acts 20, hopefully tonight. Um, before we begin, though, Brother Matt Finley is going to lead us in a word of prayer. If you would, please. us to look into uh, your servant Paul and that we can be emboldened uh, with the same type of spirit and fervor that he had to proclaim your gospel. God, we're just so grateful that you look upon us with mercy and grace. God, there's nothing that we can do to bestow any type of favor but you are a gracious God and a loving God, and we're just so thankful for that. God, be with Mike today, tonight as he's uh, going to teach this class and help us as listeners to, to listen attentively and apply whatever we can to our lives that we can be good stewards and good Christians in this world. Father, we live in a very broken world, and we're just so grateful that as everything seems to be changing around us, you are always a, an unchanging God, and that you reign, and that you will ultimately win in this sinful world, God. We're just so grateful for everything you provide us. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Okay, so going through this, I mean, obviously there are some very talented people in this room who could do a better job at dissecting this stuff than I can. But I try to put it all together with the New Testament when possible. And we see that Paul has been in Ephesus. And Ephesus, primary city of Asia, the center of the worship to Diana. And so this was a, a major city and Paul spent some time there. And a lot of a lot of significant events in the New Testament occur from his time there, from the converting of people from John's baptism to Christ, which is certainly part of the number that makes up the church at Ephesus. And then we see that he's able to perform unusual miracles. He's able to show his power over the spirit world. And the demons themselves acknowledge Paul. And that was enough to convince people to put away that belief and repent of it, burn the books as we looked at. So they're coming out of that idolatry and witchcraft. And we see that in the midst of all that, there is a riot that takes place at the end of chapter 19 from those who were affected financially from so many people being converted away from idolatry. I mean, it was actually felt in the pocketbook from so many people, especially the idol makers. And so they, they lead this great campaign against Paul. The city is divided. It's dangerous. Paul wasn't sure if he was going to survive that scene. And eventually, the assembly was dismissed at the end of chapter 19, and that's where we ended on Sunday. But it says that uh, after the uproar uh, in verse 1, this is some beautiful language here. It says, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed there three months. 
So you, you have this scene here of Paul leaving, and he's been there roughly how long? I mean, at least how long? What now? All right, at least two years. You know? At least two. It does say that in chapter 19. <clears throat> but he would go on to stay at least three years, right? From what we'll see later on in this chapter when he goes back and meets with the elders from Ephesus. So he's there a long time. And he's leaving. And this just this scene, you know, of, of him leaving knowing he will not see them, possibly again, but certainly not for a while. And he embraced them. You know, when I see that, sometimes we think, well, Paul's just, just, you know, stellar of a guy, that just so hard-shelled fella. You know, because he was a man of guts and conviction. But here you see that you also have that gentleness, Right, You have that affection. I mean, the, the ability for him to have that relationship with his brethren, to embrace them. So there's a lot of love there. You know, there's a lot of compassion. It wasn't just this, this dominant figure. I mean, here's a man that was genuinely trying to represent Christ, and he has that kind of relationship with these people. And that just, to me, just... It's just touching to see that. Because it's not the only place you'll see this. Where people knew they wouldn't see Paul for a while. And they're affected emotionally with him leaving. Alright, so he leaves to go to Macedonia. As it says in verse 1. And a lot of things happen in these next few verses. I mean, a lot of time passes. And we see that he leaves Ephesus to go to Macedonia up there and he's going to be there for it says uh, for what he went there over that region and encouraged them with many words and then he went down to Greece where you have Athens but you also have Corinth and what we've seen in looking at the New Testament especially in analyzing these letters is that as I've already pointed this out before you know, this is where he starts writing some letters that we rely on today. He spent time at Ephesus. He wrote that first letter to the Corinthians from Ephesus. He takes off. He's going to go to Macedonia. He'll write the second Corinthian letter. And then he's going to go down to Corinth and write the book of Romans when he's there. <clears throat> just three months. There's a lot of stuff you can tie together in looking at these books. I'll just show this one. That... He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 where he says that in verse 5, I will come to you, he's writing to the Corinthians, okay? I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia for I am passing through Macedonia and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. He goes on to say in verse 8, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Well, obviously, he wrote this before the riot, because he's saying, look, I can't leave. I want to come see you. My plan's to come see you. But God has opened this tremendous door for me here in Ephesus. And so when you go back to Acts 19, it's, I believe it's going back to, you know, verse 21 and 22, that it says, Paul purposed in the Spirit... When he passed through Macedonia and Nicaea to go to Jerusalem. And then, of course, to Rome was his plan. And so he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. Well, I, I think that's when he wrote the first Corinthian letter. Based on that door that opened up. Well, we see in looking in Acts 19 that that door came to a close. Because of the riot. I mean, he, he thought that he was going to die. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, the trouble in Asia. So that door is closed. He's having to leave town, and he's going to Macedonia. And that's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. He left to go to Macedonia. So he's there as he writes this second letter. And what's neat about this is that when you look at these two letters... 
you can see some common threads, but one is this idea of making sure this collection is ready for the needy saints in Judea. That's a major theme in both of these letters. He emphasizes it. Chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. So he's in Ephesus, he's writing this letter to Corinth, and he's saying, look, this collection for the saints. On the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, store it up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So his plan is to get there. But he says, and when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. So he's going to go through that area, do various things, but pick up this collection and take it to Jerusalem. He wrote that from Ephesus. In Macedonia, after he hears from Titus, hears good things about the church at Corinth, uh, he responds to that, but he also again reminds them 2 Corinthians chapter 9, concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast to you to the Macedonians. So there he is in the, among the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. So you can kind of just you know, put the puzzle together as you're, you're looking at these verses. All right, so that's happening here in Acts chapter 20. It ends, verse 1, by mentioning Macedonia. And so when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed there, or stayed three months. And during that time, he writes the letter to the Romans. Now notice how it ends, though. It says in verse 3, when he, the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria. So his plan was go to Syria. But obviously it says right here, he decided to return through Macedonia when this threat was upon him. So we go back to the map and we see that he's down here. Okay, and so he's going to backtrack. He's going to backtrack and go back through on his way to Jerusalem, especially with this collection. For the needy saints. And so that's what's happening. He's going back through. But notice how it says in verse 5 of Acts 20, there, there's some difference in the language. It says, these men going ahead waited for us. Now you can see the contrast. The first part of that chapter, it, he talks about he had gone over that region. He came to Greece, stayed there three months. And then it says, we after he leaves Macedonia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. So what can we know, I mean, obviously about that. Exactly. So Luke is back in company with Paul as he had gone back through Macedonia on his way to Jerusalem, and so Luke joins this caravan or this group of people with Paul. And all these other people who are mentioned are probably, you know, there to especially to, you know, to, to, to make sure everything was free from doubt, you know, handling that much money, that Paul wasn't using it for personal gain, that, that there were other people there, you know, handling the money as well. It wasn't just him. I think he gets into that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, we see Luke is joining here. And so what may have happened is Luke may have been in Philippi since Paul's second journey. It seems to lean in that direction. Because after, you know, Paul um, goes through there this, this last time, Luke joins him. And you read Acts 16, you know, it seems to suggest that Luke stayed behind when Paul left. Um, Acts 16, it says in verse 10 and verse 11, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. Okay, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city. And it says, um, 
And we were staying in that city for some days. And then you can keep reading, and it seems like Paul left uh, without Luke. All right, so he's been there, most likely, strengthening that church, helping that church, you know, grow and develop as the people of God. All right, so he, he spent years there, possibly. Now he's leaving. And it says that they go to Troas, that that's where everybody was going to converge, okay? And while at Troas, we see, again, some other important things taking place. It says on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now, obviously we know that nowhere in the New Testament are you going to find the language that says, take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. You're not going to have that command like you would have the, the Sabbath day, so on and so forth. But what we see is through example. That's why we can you know, reasonably conclude that from an example like this, especially by an apostle, this was something that was authorized and something that was doctrinal in its practice. Because it says the first day of the week they came together to break bread. Now, that language is, is the type of language you use when you want to refer to something on a weekly basis. And Leviticus 23 can show all of this that when God wanted something done on a weekly basis, he would specify the day of the week. Leviticus 23 and verse 3, Six days work shall be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. And so obviously he's saying you need to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, is what he told them, okay? So, which Sabbath is that, though? You know, six days you shall work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest. Well, which Sabbath? You see? And we understand the implication is what? Every Sabbath, every seventh day is the day of rest for the Jews. But notice... That's how God speaks when he wants something done on a weekly basis. He specifies the day of the week. Remember the Sabbath day, the seventh day, after six. Okay? Now you can see that contrasted even in the same chapter when he wants something done once a year. Leviticus 23 and verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So here you see that when he wants something done on an annual basis, he specifies <clears throat> the month and the day, the 14th day of the first month. You see? So which day of the year were the Jews to begin Passover? What day of the year? And it tells us right here. But see, that, that was one day out of the year when they were to start this. And he told them which day by looking at the, the number of the day of the, of the number of the month. Okay, so we can see that. And he goes through and he talks about other, the day of atonement. He just keeps using that language when he wants something done annually. Okay, he tells them which day and which month. And so when you go back, it's just, it's just right there. It's just plain as, as we can see it. On the first day of the week, well, that language goes right back to the same language of something being done every week. And here he says the first day of the week. Now, if it was going to say something annually, how might it have sound if he wanted something done annually when it comes to the Lord's Supper? I mean, how, how likely would that verse read if it was to be done once a year? Right, exactly. It would be the day of the month. You know, it would be like on the fourth day, or yeah, the fourth day of the fifth month when the saints came together to take 
or break bread, which we understand refers to communion, uh, that's, how it would, that's how it would read. But here we see something done uh, on a weekly basis. And of course, breaking bread can refer to a social meal. Acts 2, Acts 20, both have them being used, but it's all based on the context. And we see that breaking of bread also refers to communion. Uh, and even in Acts 2.42, you see that. All right, so that's, that's important. I mean, it's relevant to the time we live in for us to understand that. You know, sometimes people say, well, why do you take it every first day of the week? Well, that's the pattern we see in the New Testament. That's when they did it. They did it on the first day of the week. And so that's why we do it. That's why, we, that's why the Lord's Day is Sunday across the board. It's because people got the running start from the pattern set up by the New, New Testament apostles. All right, anything on that? Can we see that? Any questions? Again, here's a good chapter to show the importance of that. Now, what we can also see, as it goes on to say in verse 6, um, when we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. And then it says in verse 7, they, they broke bread. So what's happening here is they're taking the Lord's Supper after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You had the Passover, right? That special day. And then the following seven days was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And yet you see here, weeks after that, they're taking the Lord's Supper. Now what's the significance of that? Compared to our world, what's the significance of them taking it weeks after the Passover? Say that again. Okay, very good. It's not just a special holiday like Easter. Now let's face it, that's the world we live in. That's the world we were born into. That we were taught to take communion on this holy day of Easter, that Easter is something that we are to keep sacred. And yet, we see that these saints were not practicing that. That you don't have that emphasis on an annual feast, okay? Because if it would have happened the way men say it should, you would have people memorializing Jesus on the Sunday before or even during Passover. Because that would be the time around his crucifixion and resurrection. Go ahead. Easter is not a, a real thing. Right. Because it is a feast that is a, as an idol. Okay. That's correct. And it's based on the pagan worship of Esther. Esther. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's where it all stemmed from. Yeah, exactly. That's, you can... And any, Encyclopedia show this, that that's where it originated. So you're right. Uh, it's not something that, that is set forth in the New Testament. And it's important that we see that. It's important that we help people see that. And a text like this can show that. That if the people were taught to make that Sunday, either before or during the Passover, a significant Sunday, because that would have been, again, the time around his crucifixion and resurrection, then that's the one they would have been emphasizing. And yet we see weeks after that Sunday of the Passover, they're taking the Lord's Supper. I mean, it's right there. So we should be able to show people <clears throat> that this is not something that originates in the mind of God. It's something that was added through time. And so we need to get back to what the New Testament says about this. And again, it's all right there, okay? I mean, he just, he, he I mean, look at the language. Because if you would break this down, and if, if this is correct, in Acts 20, the Passover most likely was on a Wednesday. Now, we understand the Passover was a floating holiday. You know, one year it would be on Thursday, one year it would be on Friday. I mean, it's like our holidays, you know, some Fourth of July or you know, days of the week. 
Sometimes it's different every year of which uh, day of the month it falls on. We can understand, or even day of the week, Christmas, whatever. It, it, it's not always on a, you know, a Thursday. It's not always on a whatever. It, it floats around. Well, the same thing was true with Passover. And if you look at Acts 20 and you tie it all together, it's most likely that that Passover took place on a Wednesday, the, the Passover of the Sunday. Um, I'm sorry, the Passover at that year would have been most likely on a Wednesday because it says five days, seven days, so on and so forth. And here's how that breaks down. So they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it says after that, it says in five days join them at Troas where we stayed seven days. So if they were going to practice Easter, it would have been on that Sunday, right? Because that was the Sunday around his resurrection. And yet we see that they, days after the days of unleavened bread, five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. And on the first day of the week, we gathered, or they gathered, to break bread. So that's most likely when it would have occurred. Okay? So, I mean, it could even be a month after the Passover, the next month before the event happens that we're reading about in Acts 20 and verse 7. So it's just important that we <laughs> help people see that, that that's not what's happening in the New Testament. Okay? And <clears throat> it can all be broken down just by looking at the language. All right, anything on that before we move on from that? Okay. I got a comment here. Once, I'm sorry. Thank you. Wouldn't the Passover be based on the Jewish calendar versus the Roman calendar? So wouldn't it always be on the Sabbath, the Saturday? I, I guess oh, I don't the see Passover? why Passover would be on a Wednesday yeah. unless we're talking about a Roman calendar. Right. Um, since it's supposed to be the 14th day. I got day, you. Yeah, right? I understand. Now, I, I believe the Passover was based on the day, like, what was it, the 14th day of the... You're right, yeah, so that would, that would float around. But yeah, Sabbath is always the, the seventh Roman, day of the, the week. The Jewish calendar doesn't really change much. Huh? Like our, our, our calendar, our Roman calendar, changes right. cyclically. It doesn't, like, the moon turns all the time because it's right. a solar calendar. Yeah. Where the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. It, the first month, day of the month is always the same day. Ours is the one that floats. I don't know. Right. No, I'm, I understand. Yeah, but e you could even look today that, like, this year the Passover will be on, you know. Sometimes the Passover will come before Easter, you know, that we have on our calendars. So, um, yeah, my understanding is, though, it would, be, it would be something a different day of the week every year. I could be wrong on that, but that's, it seems to be that's how that would have worked out. I mean, let's just say Christmas is what? The 25th of December, but some, or even Halloween, you know? Some years it's on Saturday, some years it's on Thursday, and the real terrible years it's on Sunday, messes up everything, but it, you know, it would float around, uh, I think is how that would work. All right, but still, but notice, friends, listen, they're taking this after the Sunday of the Passover. It's right there. So if, if they were taught to take it, Easter that is, it would have already occurred, but instead it's something happening on a weekly basis. So let me ask you this though, um, and he was ready to depart the next day, yeah, after uh, the first day of the week. Um, First day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them, continued his message until midnight. Now let me ask you this. Were these saints practicing Jewish time and taking the Lord's Supper or Roman time? Were they, using, were they basing the Lord's Supper on Jewish time or Roman time? And I'm about to tell you why that would be significant. Well, it seems to be language of the Roman time, right? Where you have midnight, you know, the first day of the week, and then he departs the next day. So midnight is the language in the context, would, which would suggest Roman time, okay? Because, you know, Jewish time began, of course, the, the, the day at the 6 p.m., 
We understand that. Well, here's why that's important, okay? I remember years ago when, oh, when we were in Owensboro, and there was a church there that decided to offer the Lord's Supper on Saturday. And they were advertising this. This was a major effort on their part. And the, the slogan was, we're meeting you where you are, okay? And so that was the effort to try and reach out to more people. Noble effort, without a doubt. But they, in order to do this, thought they had to change when to take the Lord's Supper. And so they offered it to people on Saturday. So if you come in and take it Saturday night, then you can just do what you want on Sunday. You, you fulfilled your obligation. That was the thinking, okay? And I asked somebody who was going there about why they would reason that way when you see the New Testament teaching people to take it on the first day of the week. And she said, well, even in the New Testament, the Christians operated under Jewish time. And since the Jewish day would begin at 6 p.m., and we're offering it to people on Saturday night, then technically it is the first day of the week, is what she's thinking. That's how she reasoned this out. And so when we offer it then, then you're still doing what God wants you to do. And yet you can see in the context, that's not how these people were thinking, okay? They were basing their day, first day of the week, on midnight, right? You can see that distinction even in the language. Uh, these people were not operating under Jewish law, Jewish time. You wouldn't have had any reason to, especially coming out of idolatry like they would have. So that, I just don't believe that has much merit because this language shows a different concept and a different calendar for time. All right, you can take that for what it's worth and think about that. It goes on to say, though, in this chapter, that as they're there, Paul, again, preaches until midnight. What would you do <laughs> if I stretched this thing out till midnight? Probably. What now? I guess I'd fall out of the window. Yeah. <laughs> fall out of the window. What, what was this over here? I thought I heard something else, but... Would you? Well, let's just see. It might just be you and me. I mean, we might be the only ones left. I know my family would leave, but I mean, here he is preaching. So obviously, you're trying to get all this in, right? He's passing through. There's so many important things he wants them to know. And he's having to, you know, to be, have this concentrated effort to preach. Well, it says in verse 8 that there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. I mean, you kind of... Why was this story included? You know, of all the different events that happened, you know, you have this taking place of... Somebody falling asleep at church. And here, I do. I, this is what I see sometimes from the pulpit. Uh, that's the view I see. I'm seeing some of it right now, in fact. But it's, I mean, it's, it's common for us to get tired and, you know, sleepy, especially in, in church, we might say. But here, here they're, I mean, it's late. It's warm. They're worn out. And this guy just dozed off during Paul's, lesson because Paul just kept on speaking. He just kept on going and going and going and it just wore him out. And so he fell out and he was taken up dead. And it says that Paul went down, fell on him and embracing him <clears throat> said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. When he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and taken, talked a, a, a long way. He wasn't done yet. <laughs> he still kept talking. Um, even till daybreak he departed and they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. What would happen today if you died in church? What would happen today? Well, 
We dismiss church, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know. People die of various reasons, but well, I don't, but if somebody, just kick them aside and lead the next song and just go on. Huh? I like your thinking, brother. You probably would stay until midnight with that commitment. <laughs> Right, I'm with you. That's a good way of looking at it. I mean, really, you're worshiping, praising God. What better way to go? But what if this happened to you? What if you died in services? Well, at the very least, we can see you're not going to have somebody in here who can raise you up, right? Don't look at me. <laughs> if you die, hey, you know, I'll be looking for you. Be looking for me on the other side. But maybe this is one reason why this is in there, to show the contrast, okay? Because you're not going to have these abilities today. You and I don't have the ability to raise people from the dead. We don't have the ability to perform miracles like Paul and some of the first Christians were able to do. And the reason, of course, is why. All right, the age of miracles, or especially working through men, you know, that's past, that's over. And how can we know it's over? Okay, all right, so you don't have um, an apostle here like uh, you had there in that context. So... You know, and we've already seen through the story of Acts that the Spirit is given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, so you don't have a way of receiving the Spirit. Oh. One second, brother. One, yeah, one second, brother. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Because the few people who are still awake at home might want to hear this. So. <laughs> the purpose of the miracles was to confirm the revelation of the Word. Okay. Once, you know, uh, once the whole has come, what was uh, incomplete is done away with. Right. So the, we have the whole revealed word, and there is no more purpose for the miracles. Right. So they're done with. Okay, very good. Yeah, there's no more purpose for the miracles. Uh, they were given to confirm that a person was inspired of God or had the will of God or even to reveal the mind of God at that time. As he talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, that they were, you know, they, they knew in part, um, they prophesied in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part would be done away. So he's saying, look, we're, we're receiving in part through these gifts, but they're going to be done away with when that which is perfect, when the whole thing's revealed, then these things would be dismissed. Now we understand that this is what Jesus meant. When he said in Mark 16, after he told the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So that's right there in the Great Commission. But by putting it all together, we understand that that was limited. That, that aspect of the commission was limited. And we see why. Because he goes on to say in Mark 16, <clears throat> that verse 19, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. So that was the purpose of that. And yet today, though, we have people who claim to have the ability to, to perform miracles. And I'll just tell you, if you die in church, you're not going to have anybody who can raise you up. If you die, I mean, we don't have the ability to revive you as, as far as in a miraculous sense. That's, uh, that's something God no longer gives us. Uh, and so these people who handle snakes 
as if they're trying to demonstrate their faith in God, uh, they're, they're taking that out of context, okay? Because Jesus says that when that would happen, you wouldn't die from it. And you see snake handlers dying. <laughs> that happens. Um, drink poison, so on and so forth. All right, so you see that contrast. That's a major contrast with that world versus our world. But for whatever reason, <clears throat> that's included in the commentary of Luke in, in this text. Any other reason why you think it might be included? Uh, you know, just throwing that to you. Uh, Johnny, uh, let's see here. Matt's coming. I'm trying to... <clears throat> okay, all right, I got it. Yeah. In First Kings 17, okay. Elijah raised a small child. Okay, that was that's dead true. From the, from the Old Testament. Right. So I look at it as the Holy Spirit doing the work. Right. All right, so you had Elijah raising the boy from the dead. Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. And Elisha did the same thing too, if I'm not mistaken, right? But yeah, definitely Elijah. And so you're, the comparison would be the power of the Holy Spirit is what you're talking about? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. what I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, to show that a person was, again, proven or chosen by God to do that work. I, I, that crossed my mind, too, reading through that, of how he laid on the boy and, and brought him back to life. All right, so, you know, you can see the parallel there. But, again, for whatever reason, this is included in the story of Acts, okay? All right, so that's what happens there at Troas. Now, it goes on to say that they take off and they went ahead, uh, we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asus there intending to take Paul on board for he, so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. That's a pretty neat thought. You know, here they go on the ship to, to leave, and yet Paul travels by walking. Any thoughts on why he would do that? I mean, it would just be pure speculation, but it's in there. You know, and, and knowing how Paul is, of course, he's probably trying to reach more people. When he met us at Asus, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Kios. Now, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this stuff right. You know what I mean, Johnny? You know, sometimes this stuff just... Anyway, the following day we arrived at Samus and their Tragilium. We stayed at Tragilium. The next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now, why do you think that was the case? Because that was, a, that was a, a sense of urgency for him to get to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And I've pondered that, thinking, what would be so urgent? What would be the reason? Because that's why he said he didn't want to go to Ephesus, because he knew he'd be bogged down. You know, as far as wanting to be with the people, people wanting him to, to stay. So it would have, you know, it would have hindered his journey. So he, he called for the elders at Ephesus to meet him at Miletus, which is what we will talk about on Sunday with James. But what about this? Why was he so pressed to get to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost? Again, pure speculation. Oh, Mike? Okay. That's when the most people are going to be there. Yeah, that seems to be the, the, the motive here because he would have more people there to talk to, evangelize, I mean, the man's pattern has been synagogue, 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 you know, trying to reach out to as many Jews as possible. Let's keep in mind he has a bunch of money with him too, right? He and his companions are trying to get this money to the needy saints who were there. That was important. You know, I thought, well, maybe, you know, with the day of Pentecost, uh, it was, there's a famine, right? There's a famine taking place in the land. That's what's happening. And so maybe, you know, they would be limited even more with all these people coming in town for this feast. I'm not sure. But yeah, the, the most reasonable 
motive would have been the platform, you know, to be able to teach more people and reach more people. Because the man was all about that. Uh, he was all about talking to people and giving them an opportunity to hear about Jesus and to hear about the resurrection and to hear about this kingdom that he has established. Okay? And we kind of need to leave it right there. I don't want to mess up James. Well, there we go. All right then. Thank you.